This is the second in a series of videos in which I'm demonstrating how this Fluke 9010A microsystem troubleshooter can be used in fault finding. There are almost an infinite number of ways that this machine can be used, so this will of course not be uh, an all-encompassing series of videos. I'm just going through some basic uh, methods and types of testing that you can do with it. Uh, but if there is anything in particular you want me to look at then uh, please leave a comment. Now in the first video I looked at the basics of connecting this to a unit under test and in this video we'll take it to the next step and look at how to uh, write some very simple programs. There are built-in test programs for bus test, ram test and we did look at those briefly in the previous videos and we will come back to these um, later on. Uh, but for now we'll start by looking at some very basic programs. There are some manual operations you can perform, so read, write, that sort of thing. You can do um, a read of a certain address and cause the fluke to repeat that. And you can do that without writing any programs. So there are some fairly good uh, built-in functions that you can use. Now, as I mentioned in the previous video, one of the issues you get when you're trying to repair electronics, especially complicated microprocessor systems, is if you put a scope probe onto any of the buses or the uh, in-out pins of memory chips, quite often those chips are in arrays and they're all connected together, so all the outputs are connected together, some are tri-stated, some are not, and if the system code is trying to run, it's almost impossible trying to determine what's going on. Where something like the flute comes being extremely useful is you can um, stop the unit under test main processor from running and you can run very specific tests such as writing to or reading from a specific address. Uh, and that's where programming starts to become very powerful where you can um, create a simple program in the flute and have it perform very specific testing. Uh, it will give you some results in its own right, but it will also allow you to use a scope uh, on the unit under test board to do some very specific and targeted fault finding. So for example, if you have an array of DRAM chips, using a scope alone with the system code running, it will be very difficult to determine if particular devices are working. Whereas if you run specific programs from the fluke, you can target specific devices and see if they're working the way that they should. So we'll go through that very briefly in this video, how to create programs, uh, how to enter them, how to edit them, and then how to use those programs in conjunction with a scope to do some fault finding on the board. So I'll power up the Fluke. Again apologies if the display is flickering, I um, haven't found a way to prevent that. I've, tr I've tried all different frame rates but uh, None of them really match what the Fluke uh, refresh rate is, so it tends to flicker. Uh, one thing I would say here is when you enter programs on the Fluke, they are lost when you turn the machine off. They're not um, permanently stored. Now, you can buy tapes and you can store the programs in tape. And you can also get a serial interface um, module that plugs into this if you don't have one of those. Uh, then you will have to enter the um, programs every time you start up the fluke. Uh, incidentally, anyone out there that's interested in a serial interface card for a fluke, if you can leave a comment, uh, as you probably know I create reproduction boards for old equipment, and one I'm currently looking at is possibly creating a serial board for the fluke 9010A, and uh, really whether I do that or not depends on the amount of interest that I get. So if there's enough people that want one of those boards, then I'll go ahead and create reproduction boards, or at least bare boards. So uh, let me know if that's something you'd be interested in. Okay, so step one is how to create a program. As I said, there are all these manual steps that you can run without a program if you want to, but they're very self-explanatory and they're also incorporated into programs. So uh, as I go through uh, creating these programs, just bear in mind these functions can be used, or most of them can be used uh, standalone. You don't need to incorporate them into a program. For example, read and write can be used on their own, um, but they are very powerful when used within a program. 
So as I say, each time you power up the Fluke, the programs will be gone. So currently there aren't any programs stored in this machine. So we'll create a very simple program. To create a program, you simply press the program key. You'll get this program prompt and it's asking you for a number. Whenever you get the cursor flashing rapidly, it's waiting for input of some sort. Uh, when a particular input has been completed, the flashing cursor will disappear, although what you've entered may still um, show on the screen. So in this case, it wants a program number. We'll enter program one. Still flashing uh, cursor. It's waiting for you to press enter or the second digit of the program number. In this case, we'll use just digit one, press enter, and as you can see, program one has been created and we're now getting the programming enunciator light flashing to tell us that we're in program mode. If you wanted, you could save the program as it is. It just, uh, there's nothing in it, so it wouldn't do anything. Uh, we'll enter a single line within this program and in this program, all we'll do is print something on the screen of the uh, fluke. So to display something on the fluke, you just use the display command and then you enter the text that you want to be displayed. So now unfortunately the key layout on the fluke is not particularly intuitive when you're trying to enter text. So these are all the sub characters you can see printed on the back plate rather than the actual keys themselves and they're not necessarily in an easy to understand order but uh, they are there and the manual will just show you where they are. So once you've entered the text that you want you can see the cursor is still flashing so we could enter more text but that's all I want to enter into this line so I'll press enter to terminate the entry and this program is now complete so I'll press program again and you can see program one is closed and if we want to go back in and look at the program or edit it, press program, the program number you're interested in. If the program doesn't exist, it will be created. If it does exist, it will be opened. And you can see it's been opened. It consists of 15 bytes and we can use the more and prior keys to scroll through it. So if I press the more key, it shows us the first line of the program. If I press the more key again, it says we're at the end of the program. If I press prior, goes back and try it again we're at the start of the program okay program again we'll exit program mode you can tell we're in program mode because the programming light will be flashing uh, so what you can do now is execute that program so to execute of course you press the execute key it's now asking you for which program you want to run we want to run program one enter and you can see the programs run and printed the text that we wanted on the screen Okay, that's essentially how you will create, write and edit and run all the programs. One point I'll make here is you can enter multiple programs, but to get the most out of the fluke, it's best to try and understand how the fluke is arranged internally. Now, for anyone that's a C or C++ programmer, the best way to view the fluke is that the fluke is the main program within your application and each actual program you create on the fluke is really a function uh, because they can call each other so any program you have and that you've entered uh, can be called by another uh, function another, another program so they're not completely separate programs and that is quite a powerful a tool to have because it allows you to create things like timing loops or uh, out data output loops that you can call recursively from other programs and that means that so you can get an extremely powerful set of uh, programs written and it doesn't need to be horrendously long complicated single programs. As with most programming you need to be able to transfer data from one program or one function to another. And that is something you can do with the fluke. So if we take a look at the register set for the fluke, if you're not a programmer, this might seem a bit confusing, but it's relatively straightforward. There are 16 registers available to programs in the fluke. 
Registers 1 to 9 are what are called non-dedicated, which means that you can use them as kind of scratch pad uh, registers or variables. Um, and they are user registers. You can use them as part of your um, programs quite freely. You can change the contents, read the contents, and as I say, treat them really as variables. Um, registers A to F and also register 0 are dedicated or semi-dedicated registers. You can still use them to write to and read from, so you can still store data in them, but they are updated by the fluke in response to certain commands being executed. So for example, when you do a read, um, if you use the, the read function, then registers E and F are updated with the uh, data and address respectively that was used in the read instruction and in fact that's how you get data that you read from the unit under test. You perform a read within your program and then you can access the data that you've read from the E register. Um, one slight complication on this is that registers 0 through 7 are what you might term as local variables in a C program. So there are duplicates of those available to each of your programs. So if you have 10 programs, then you have 10 sets of registers um, 0 through 7. So they're local variables. They are available to each individual program. And so they aren't affected by uh, the individual programs that are running, even if you call um, one program from another, then those registers are still local to each of those um, programs. Um, however, as it says here, registers 8 through F are global, meaning that they're available to all the programs globally, and there's only one set of them. So if you want to pass a parameter from one program to another, you would put it into one of the global registers and then the other programs can access that same value. So they are akin to global variables in a C program, whereas the um, local registers are the equivalent of local variables in a C program. So again, it gives you quite a powerful platform to uh, write these programs. And it's worth getting the used to that before you start, so you, you can make the most of the fluke and your programs don't need to be more complicated than they otherwise would be. Okay, so we've created one program that doesn't really do anything particularly useful. So we'll now create another program that hopefully will do something that's uh, of a bit more use. As I said, one of the main functions I tend to use the fluke for is to create known signals on a target board. So rather than trying to run the target system wrong and then pick out the bits of signal functionality that I want and then try and figure out if it's what it should be, I attach the fluke. That of course stops the system code running because the microprocessor is no longer there. Uh, and then you can create programs that generate specific activity on the target board. So in this case, we've got a very simple program, and all it does is it writes a value to a specific address, uh, and then it repeats that over and over again. And of course, that means that if you put a scope onto the uh, memory ICs in this case, so the address here, if you recall, we're using the REN computer main board as our uh, demonstration board here, and its main DRAM uh, resides in the address space F000 to FFFF then this is the first memory location in that address space and what we're doing here is writing a value of 55 to that address and then we're repeating that so this will do nothing more on the target board than repeatedly generate a write operation to that memory address so you can of course generate uh, very specific signals on the target board now, if, like me, you repair machines like um, pets, then you've no doubt at some point created one of these. It is, of course, a NOP generator. And what you do is you pull out the system processor, you plug this in, 
and this just causes the system to generate uh, NOP operations, NOP instructions, and it um, walks through the entire address space doing that. And that allows you to do some fairly uh, specific fault finding. And because it addresses all address space sequentially, then it allows you to properly test the address space in the data bus. Without that, it's very difficult to do that test because the system code doesn't really sequentially access address spaces. It just uh, accesses them sort of semi-randomly and it's very difficult to determine what's going on. Now, you can do something very similar with the Fluke, or if not identical, and in fact the program we just looked at does something fairly similar to that. We'll look at a, a more um, detailed program in a few minutes that um, walks the address space. But uh, for now we'll enter this program. So the first thing we need to do is to create the program. So we'll call this uh, program 2. So we've created program 2. And then we need to generate a label. Now a label is just a position in the program that we can uh, subsequently jump back to. So it's an entry point in the program. Uh, they can be in any order you want. They don't need to be label 1, label 2 um, through the program. You can start with label 6 if you want. Uh, but it's entirely up to you as to how you want to write the programs. And of course these can be repeated in different programs. You're not limited across the entire set of programs to uh, one set of labels. And in fact they are independent. So um, a particular label in one program is not visible to other programs. Okay, so to generate a label, we simply press the label key and then it's asking for something. In this case, it wants a label number, so we'll call this label one. Notice there's no longer any flashing cursor, so you don't need to press the enter key. So that's our first line entered. We now want to uh, create a, a line that writes um, a value to a certain address. So in this case, we want to write and it's asking at. So we already, we already have the at um, symbol, it's looking for an address. So we want to use the address F000. And within a program, you tend to enter the lines the same way you would if you were doing this manually. So if we press the enter key, it's now asking us what value, what data value we want to write there. And if we look at the program, we've decided to use a value of 55. So you just enter 55. Five. The cursor is still flashing, so it's waiting for something else. In this case, it's waiting for you to press enter. So we'll press enter. And then that's that line done. And then the final line, just go to one. And this is just going to jump back to label one. So uh, again, we'll just press the go to key. We've got a flashing cursor. Where do we want to jump to? Label one. There's no longer a flashing cursor, so we don't need to press enter. If the cursor stops flashing during data entry, then there's no more keys that you can press. And if you press any more keys, then it will simply generate a new line within the program. So we can now look through the program. If we go back to the start of program two, line one is label one. The next one is write at F000 equals 55. And then the last line is go to one press program so we've uh, exited programming mode and if we now press execute line two uh, program two enter uh, it's given me a unit under test power fail simply because I don't have the um, REN switched on so what I'll do is power up the REN okay so we have the REN running what I'm going to do um, before I run this program again is just run the uh, REN so I'm just going to run the unit under test Okay, so the REN is uh, now running. I've got the welcome screen on the REN display. I'll now run the program again. So that's program two. And notice this time it is executing. So you do need to have the unit under test functional for these tests to work. Now mostly it just needs the clock input and the control bus to work. But as I mentioned in the previous video, or an earlier video, you do need to have the unit under test working to a certain extent before the fluke becomes particularly useful. And that's its main drawback. It does need the system to be semi-functional before you can start testing on it. 
however the sorts of failures you might get can be quite useful so uh, what you use it for is is kind of dependent on um, how well you know it and how well you know the system that you're trying to repair so because we're now running this test if we were to put a scope on memory then of course we would see this memory location being accessed and if it's not we can then start fault finding trying to figure out uh, what's not working but this gives us a very consistent set of signals on the board that we can then trace okay so st we'll stop the program okay so that program is now stopped a lot of the time what you'll want to do is use registers to hold variables and so the next program that we enter will use a register to hold a variable value in this case we'll use it to hold the address value so we'll generate the next program so I'll call this program 3 the program has been created and in this program we'll use register 1 and again we don't need to use the registers sequentially we can use any register we want um, as long as the register is a general use register uh, or it's a register that we specifically want to uh, make use of one of the dedicated registers so in this case it's, we'll use register 1 and we'll initialize it to a value of F000 which is the start address that we want the test to run from so we press the register key we've got a flashing cursor it wants to know which register we want to use so register 1 equals and so you can see the input is fairly uh, intuitive once you get the hang of how the loop is working and what it's asking for so we've still got a flashing cursor it wants to know what value register one should be initialized to so in this case we want to initialize it to this value we've finished entering this but notice we still have a flashing cursor because we could enter a, long, uh, a longer value um, but I'm finished with the entry so I'll press the enter key so that's the first line entered we now need a label we'll use label one so label one that's done we'll now display the register value so display now there is some quirkiness as to how you enter certain values when you're trying to create displays if you were to just start typing now on um, the um, character keys you just get text but what I want to do is display the register value so what you have to do is press the run UUT key you then get the at um, symbol which means um, display which register or which value and in this case I want to uh, display register 1 so it's not a particularly intuitive um, format but um, it does work and once you've got the, the hang of it it's fairly straightforward then press the enter key that line's now entered and we now want to write the value this is the same line we had in the previous program so it's write at and then the address but here we want to use a register value for the address in this case register 1 so register it's a flashing cursor wants to know which register register 1 and then what value do we want to write there so register 1 if we press enter we we'll get the equal sign and then we want to write a value of 55 and then we just simply add the last line which is go to 1 so press the go to key and then the label we want to jump to and we're now finished if we scroll through the program then you can see that we've initialized the register we've created label 1 we've created the display output we've written the value and then we're looping back so we'll finish entering that program and now we can execute the program and the program is now uh, executing so as you can see the program is now running and it will continue to run as long as you want it to until it stops again this is quite a powerful feature now although it's only doing the same thing that we did in the first program the difference here is we're using a register value and that tends to imply that we can change this register value on each loop and in fact that's what we'll do for the next program okay so this is our next program it's a bit more complicated than the last one but still a fairly straightforward program uh, what we're going to do is initialize register one 
to a value of 4000 hex. We're going to display that value on the Fluke display. We're going to write a value at the address stored in register 1, and that value will be 45. We're going to increment register 1, and then we're going to keep doing that until register 1 gets to the last address that we want to write to. Now, if you look at the, the, the uh, keys on the Fluke, you'll notice that on the programming keys, you've only got a greater than sign, there isn't a less than sign. But you can do less than, of course, just by reversing your two parameters. So uh, A is greater than B. If you reverse that and say B is greater than A, then it reverses the logical sense of the uh, statement. So though you only have a greater than key, if you want to do less than, just swap your two parameters around. Okay, so I'll enter this program. I won't uh, make you sit through that, it will only take a few minutes, but uh, as soon as I've got this entered, uh, we'll have a, a quick look at it and see what it does. Okay, so I've entered this program. I've entered it as program 4. So if we open program 4, and now we'll scroll through. So the first line, I've initialized register 1 to a value of 4000 hex. Uh, if you recall, 4000 hex is the first address of our character memory space. So the next line is label 1, and then I'm displaying the value of register 1 on the Fluke display. I'm then writing a value to the address that's in register 1, and I'm writing a value of 45 to that address. So in other words, I'm writing a value of 45 to the uh, character memory space that's pointed to by register 1. I'm then incrementing register 1 and then checking to see if we have finished the tests. In this case I've got it set so that it, it will only run up to 4020 hex and then it will uh, abort. If we're still below 4020 then it will jump back to label 1. And then finally once we've reached uh, a value of 4020 it will come to this line in which case it will uh, change the display. In this case all it's going to do is add the word finished to the end of the current count that we had on the display and then the character at the end is the bell character and that just causes the flute to beep to enunciate that it's finished the, um, uh, the program. So we'll go back into normal mode and I will now run the program. So that's program 4 and you can see that it's counting up through the address um, and it's showing the address because we included that in the program and then once it got up to the address that we uh, told it to it uh, finished the uh, test. So what we'll do now is I'll change this program slightly and then we'll look at the uh, the REN so we can see what effect this has on the screen and I'll just change the program so it runs up through more of the uh, display memory now editing the programs in the Fluke is fairly straightforward once you know how to do it. Uh, so you go into the program that you want to edit and as you saw before we can scroll through. Now in this case I want to change this line. Now you can't just edit the lines unfortunately but what you can do if you press the clear key it will delete the line and it will delete that particular step. If you then scroll through the program to the line before where you want to enter the new line, which is where we already are, then you can just start typing in the new line. So we can now enter the new line that we want. So if, and then the final value that we want to check for. So in this case it's D000. And if that is greater than register 1, then we want to go to label 1. In other words, if we haven't got to the last address yet, we want to loop round. Uh, and that's it. Um, we can now scroll through the program to make sure it's correct, which it is. We'll exit program mode, and we can now run the program. Before I run it again, I'll move the camera so you can see the screen on the, uh, on the REN. Okay, so you can already see the results of the test we ran previously. If I start the program running again so that it will go further through the address space. So the program's now running, it's counting up on the fluke display. But as you can now see, it's writing data further down the REN display. 
Uh, it is quite slow, you can see it's not really uh, progressing very quickly. You could speed this up by not having the fluke display the value on the uh, fluke display itself and then it would run um, probably at least twice as quickly. Uh, but what you can do now is leave this running and it will incrementally test the entire uh, character memory space. Also while it's doing this of course it's not doing anything else in the system it's only writing to the um, character RAM so you can now get a scope and do some fairly in-depth testing on the uh, memory for the display and you're not hampered by all the other activity going on on various address and data buses and you can of course do this sort of testing with any of the devices in the REN whether it's the sound generator chip, CRT controller, serial device once you know what address they reside at you can write a specific test program and um, do some very targeted testing just by writing a simple program uh, that writes or reads from or to particular addresses. What I'll do, I'll leave this running and let it uh, complete the test. It will take a while as you can see uh, and then I'll get back on camera and we can see what it's done because there are some other things that if you watch these tests you can uh, glean from this and in this case it's really how the graphics are arranged on the system. So as I say I'll leave it running you'll see how the overlays uh, work and as it progresses through the test I'll switch the camera back on now and again so you can see how the screen has been updated and that will give you a clue as to how the REN memory uh, configuration is arranged. Okay so the test has been going for about 15 minutes and you can see it's working its way uh, down the screen the display is indeed interlaced as we uh, first suspected so each um, character will consist of a, a series of interlaced uh, lines there doesn't appear to be a separate character generator chip on the REN so I'm assuming that the character generation is done within the uh, ROM itself, the system ROM um, but one thing that's interesting here is uh, you notice it's not overwriting completely the uh, original REN logo or the text, what it's doing is it's inverting it so it looks like um, the two layers, the layer we're writing to and the uh, layer that uh, was already there uh, are being XORed together to give us the final result and that again gives you a good indication and a lot of information as to how the graphics system and the memory is arranged on the REN and that can be very useful in fault finding uh, the other thing to bear in mind here is that we're writing a value of 45 to the, um, the character RAM and yet what's happening is the, um, the background is giving us a solid colour. So that tends to indicate that we have a background layer, um, a text layer and a graphics layer. That's uh, what I would guess it to be and we'll, hopefully we'll see that as it progresses. If that is the case then we should see that at least one of the layers gives us a pixel display that relates to the value we're writing to it. And that was why I chose a value of 45 because it's a relatively easy uh, pattern to pick up on the display and I suspect it will start doing that once we get to the end of um, this test. I have run this test before but I've never waited until it's got to the end of the first screen as um, you can see it does take a, a long time so it will be interesting to see what it does once it's finished this initial part of the testing. Uh, I could of course uh, while this test is uh, running be looking at the uh, display generation circuitry looking for faults, uh, checking that the memory is um, being addressed correctly and as I said before because all we're doing on the system is writing to the video RAM then there is no other activity going on on the main board that will uh, cause confusion and we won't get all the usual signals um, on the data bus and address bus that uh, normally make it very difficult to fault find. So I'll turn the camera off and uh, we'll, we'll come back once it's uh, progressed through the initial um, background update. Okay so as you can see we're getting very close to completing the uh, first uh, full screen update with this test. Uh, there's a few things it's told us already. Uh, firstly uh, the first screen update started at 4000 hex 
and it looks like it's going to end at 8000 hex so in other words it's a 16k memory block for each screen buffer and I don't know exactly how they're arranged possibly in uh, double buffering arrangement or uh, whatever else um, uh, Ren decided to do for the various modes that the system will operate in. It's now started to go back over the screen again which is pretty much what we expected. They are overlaid uh, blocks of memory and the other thing you probably can't see is that the values being written to the screen, the pixel blocks, uh, are now showing a value that relates to a, a byte value of 45. So if, you probably can't see it but if I look closely I can see that uh, the pixel arrangement that's been written is what you would uh, expect from that uh, 45 value. So again this now tells us uh, that the video memory is arranged in a specific way where certain blocks um, have a function for background and others for foreground. So you can get quite a lot of information doing this. Now I don't normally use it for this, mostly as I say I use it to generate uh, repetitive known signals and it's extremely good for that. It also lets you look at the, uh, the way that the um, hardware decoding works on the board. So I don't have a schematic for the REN so this does give me uh, an awful lot of information. Okay so I'll leave this test running. I'll let it complete. There's still about another 30 minutes to go yet before it finishes and I'll let you have a quick look at the screen once it's complete. It looks like there's going to be just one more screen of uh, information for it to update. Um, but one thing that is obviously apparent with this test is how slow it is to send commands from the Fluke to the uh, system that you're testing. We could speed this up as I mentioned. We could stop the Fluke from updating its display. That would more than double the speed. But even so it's still going to take um, well over 30 minutes for this test to complete. That doesn't really matter for most of the testing I do because what I'm really looking for, as I say, is repetitive signals that I can control. But sometimes it, it does matter and you want to be able to run the system much more uh, quickly. With a system like the REN, the main limitation with this type of program is that you can't run Z80 commands or processor commands on the unit under test directly from the fluke and although for a lot of testing that doesn't really matter if you recall on the REN we have a bank switching arrangement where the bank switching is done through in-out commands now we can't directly run the in-out commands from the fluke we can sort of do it in a roundabout way but really what we need to be able to do to fully test a machine like the REN is to run an in-out command directly from the uh, REN hardware itself and the Fluke cannot do that directly however there is a way you can run machine code using the Fluke directly on the target machine and it's fairly obvious when you think about it what you do is you simply write the instructions you want to execute into the unit under test memory uh, so you test the unit under test RAM first, make sure there's at least one block of it that is reliable. You can then write whatever values you want into that uh, memory address space. So as I showed earlier, you can do that manually or through a program. You can then send any value at all to those memory addresses. And of course, that implies that you can send uh, actual machine code programs to the unit under test. So what you could do for example is to send some instructions that cause the REN to switch banks and once you've run that code the REN would be in a different bank arrangement. The latches that control the banking would have been updated to whatever you've told it to do and then you can run whatever test programs you want either directly from the fluke or again by loading them into the unit under test memory. So that's what we'll look at in the next video in this series is how to load machine code into the unit under test and execute that machine code on the unit under test. So rather than running it from the fluke as we are at the moment, 
it will run directly from the unit under test memory and that again if you're running a program like this if you were to load it into the unit under test RAM it would run thousands of times faster and so this test would complete in uh, a second or two and whether that's what you want to do or um, you are looking for uh, repetitive signals depends entirely on what you're trying to achieve with the unit so that's what we'll look at in the next video um, but I'll just come back in a, a few minutes to have a look at the final screen once this test is completed so you can see how the, uh, uh, the, the screen updates and how the various layers on this particular machine are updated. You can see already that this particular layer um, is the layer that holds the logo because it's been overwritten by this test so that, again that tells us uh, exactly what the arrangement is for the memory overlays in the REN. Okay, so the test is getting very close to completing. It's been running for around an hour. As you can see, this um, second pass has completely overwritten the original uh, welcome screen. So that goes to confirm our assumption as to how the overlays were working. And as I say, this test is very slow because we're running it from the fluke. But in the next video, we'll look at loading um, assembly uh, instructions into the unit under test uh, memory and running them from there. Of course before you do that you do need to test the memory on the unit under test to make sure it's working. There's no point trying to run machine code um, programs from the unit under test if its memory is not uh, properly uh, functional. So what we'll do is I'll just move the camera so you can see the fluke screen again just watch it complete the test and then in the next video I'll look at um, assembly language programs running from the unit under test.